Now, if you will, take your Bibles and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter one, and we're going to look at verses three and four. Would you follow, please, uh, read? Paul wrote, "Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort." who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Tomorrow, as we all know, is July the 4th, and our country will celebrate 200 and 46 years of independence. And as Americans, we all perhaps will be involved in that celebration, maybe by way of cookouts or picnics. We might go to the lakes or to the beaches or to the mountains or to the parks. While we might even, when it's dark, shoot some fireworks, right? Or we might go to some fireworks display and Watch the, the beauty of the sky light up with those fireworks. We might do some things like that tomorrow, right? Uh, it should be a good day for us all. However, let me tell you, on the flip side of the coin of life, there are some tomorrow, as they are today, and as in every day, will be struggling. For this life is indeed hard. It is a very treacherous and perilous journey that we are in. The cup of problems is filled to the brim and it's running over. There are all kinds of problems in this life and none of us, none of us are excluded from them. In fact, it says here though that uh, Jesus is the answer to those problems. He is the answer. He is the solution. We can always rely on him. In verse 4 of the text that I read just a moment ago, it says that God, by way of his Son, comforteth us in all our tribulation. And the word comforteth means help. Let us all be reminded of Psalm 46, 1, which says God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God will help. He is the solution. He is the answer to life's problems. Now I'm going to stand here behind the sacred desk this morning for the next few moments and I'm going to share what I believe are four of the biggest problems that we are dealing with in our lives in this world and particularly in the United States of America as we celebrate July the 4th. And the first problem I want to share is the great political divide. Our nation was founded to be one nation under God. However, we have gotten to the point in our land where we are a people as a whole who think we are one nation over God. When I put on the sign, God bless America, and when we hear Kate Smith or Vestal Goodman sing God Bless America, we must understand that America cannot, shall not, will not ever be blessed unless we are under God. When we think we are over God, we can forget the blessings. We can forget the good things from him. He will not honor a people that asserts his authority, and tries to take his place. Now let me tell you that we are, we're founded to be one nation under God, 
But as we all know so clearly well, we have become one nation that is divided and split down right down the middle. It is shameful. It is embarrassing. That's what I said about the veteran who fought in World War II who said that this is not the same America that we fought for. What we have become compared to what we were at one time or another. So what is the solution? We can try to depend on politicians. But now let me say that I do not like to bring politics into the church. Because politics can further divide a people. Therefore, let me say that in here, in the church, it's all about Jesus. I preach him and him crucified. Because we cannot rely on politicians. And I'm not even going to go to the uh, talking about political parties and political affiliations and so forth. Look, look, look. We cannot rely on politicians. It's like, uh, have you heard this about the busload of politicians that was going down a winding country road one day and the bus lost control uh, carrying a busload of politicians and the bus flipped over and hit a barn. The old farmer was on his tractor. He gets off to investigate and find out what happened. He saw that it was a busload of politicians. And what did he do? He dug a great big hole and buried all of them. <laughs> now, the sheriff came a few days later looking for them. And he asked the old farmer, he saw, he saw their bus over flipped and hit the barn. And he said, where are the politicians? And he said, I dug a hole and I buried all of them. And the farmer said, oh my goodness. He said, were any of them alive? And he said, the farmer said, well, some of them said they were, but you know those crooked politicians, they're all liars. Look, folks, we cannot rely on politicians. I don't care who they are. But we can rely on God. Amen. And he is the only one who can bring our country together. Did you hear what the choir sang a few moments ago? We sang uh, asking God to hear our prayer and heal our land. He's the only one who can do it. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. You know the verse. If my people, which are called by my name, says God, will seek my face, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. The great political divide. You have one group of people that believes one way, another group of people who believes another way, and neither side can get along with each other. God is the only way. We need to pray, pray, and pray for our country. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, a second problem that we're having to deal with as July the 4th comes up, in our world and in our land is what I would say is the unbearable hardship of economic woes. The economy is struggling. We all know that. We know that the price of gas is really getting way, way up. And it's hard for us to fill up our tanks. In fact, sometimes we can't even fill them up anymore. I have to put about half full just to get by so we can buy food to eat, which also has gone up. And the price and cost of food is so high, it's getting so unbearable to us all. It's hurting, isn't it? You know, there was a man standing beside another man in a grocery store looking at milk. I go and I buy milk a lot at uh, Food Lion. 
And I don't ever pay attention to price. Donna tells me, Randy, I always look at the price, and I'm bad about just going to get what I need and just buying it. But I think, and ladies, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the milk about somewhere in the neighborhood of about four fifty a gallon or something like that right now? Or is that right? Sound right? You don't buy milk, do you? <laughs> All right. Two men were looking at milk. And it was say four fifty a gallon. Another one says, We can go down to the store just down the road here and you get it for four dollars. You save you fifty cents. And the man says, Well, uh, that would be good, but you know, I, I just like to the, the be able to buy it here and now. I just, instead of having to get in the car and go down the road. And so the man over here, he says, well, let me ask you a question. What if it was uh, $8 for a gallon of milk down at this store, and it's $5 here, what would you do? And he said, well, naturally, if that's the difference, then I'd get in the car and I'd go down and buy it for for $5. If it was $8 here and $5 there, I'm getting mixed up. But anyway, he said, well, what if it's uh, $20 here for a gallon of milk and 20 or $20 there and $25 here for a gallon of milk? He said, well, I think then I'd just give me a can of Coca-Cola. <laughs> but when it comes to the gas pump, there's no alternative. And it's hurting us. It's putting a squeezing on us. So what do we do? What can our country do? Well, let me just say, again, my focus is not on politics, but on the Lord Jesus. Amen. And let me say that all we can do during hard and trying times, all we can do is trust the Lord and pray. And this is what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord, lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We must give unto God. Give our lives unto him. Give our talents unto him. Give our service unto him. Give our commitment unto him. Give our money unto him. Now, it says in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, good measure. Press down, shaking together, and running over. Now, that... A lot of people in what's called prosperity evangelism will take that verse out of context and they'll say that that verse means that if you give financially unto God, that he's going to give liberally unto you. That's, that's so untrue. That's not biblical. That's not scriptural. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that if we give God money, that he will bless us with money. It doesn't say that. But it does say that if we give ourselves unto God, we give our commitment, give our talents, give our money, we give ourselves in service to him, give our time to him, we give ourselves to God, he will supply and meet our needs. Now I tell you what, there have been times that I felt like I myself personally have hit rock bottom. But I've never gone without because God's always took care of me. Amen. And the same thing with all of us. We may feel sometimes it's so difficult, the strain is so hard, and how am I going to make it? God will take care of his kids, especially when his kids are faithful in giving unto him. We may not be able to afford to fill up our car with gas or to buy a gallon of milk or to go out and eat in a restaurant, but as long as we have Jesus in our life, we have riches untold. Come on. Now, the third thing I want to share is the difficult situation of suffering, sickness, and death. Suffering, sickness, and death, they go along with each other. You see, uh, if you're suffering, you're suffering because of sickness, and sickness often leads to death. And another thing in America that we have had to deal with in this past few years, particularly in 2020, was covid COVID-19, coronavirus. You know, over a million people in America have died from this so unnecessary and terrible disease. Over a million people. That's a lot of people. And what is the reason for this? 
You know, you think of third world poor countries, you think of poor sanitation, you think of bad hygiene and things like that can cause or, uh, disease and sickness. This is America, right? How could this happen here? We can blame the Wuhan lab in China, and we can, we can talk about things like that all day long. But I want to tell you what is the deepest root behind it all, and it is a germ, a filthy, nasty, despicable, horrible, highly contagious germ. You say, what germ is it? I'll, I'll just tell you how to spell it. Ready? Listen to me. Here's how you spell it. Starts with the letter S. S-A-T-A-N. Did you get it? There's another version or another way to spell it. It is D-E-V-I-L. Satan is the filthy, nasty germ in this life. Now this is what happened. Man and woman was created by God and put in a garden. Everything was perfection in the fullest sense of the word. Everything was absolutely fine, absolutely good, until the devil who had fallen from grace out of heaven, known as Lucifer, fell to the earth and slithered his way as a deceiving serpent, snake, in that garden and tempted even Adam to commit sin and then everything has gone haywire, everything has gone down ever since. The world is so messed up because of that nasty, filthy germ called Satan. And there are not gloves that we can wear. There are, is not a mask that we can wear. And there is not a vaccination that we can take that will help against Satan. These things may help against other viruses, but not against the devil. So what is the answer? What is the solution to the problem? The answer to the problem, as the whole theme of this message has been so far, is that Jesus is the answer. He's the only answer. He's the only one who can defend us against the devil, who can help us overcome the devil. He's the only one. Jesus is what it's all about. Now, I will tell you that COVID is not the only disease in the world either. It's not the only virus. For hospitals are filled with sick people. Nursing homes are filled with aging people who are declining physically and mentally. Mortuaries are filled with caskets containing corpses of people who are dying every day. Because that germ, Satan, has infiltrated his, itself infiltrated itself into this country, into this world, into our lives, and he is destroying people left and right. Those who are saved, he's making them sick. Those who are lost, he's making them sick. But the devil is doing everything he can to cause misery, heartache, and pain and sorrow to everyone in this life. Jesus is the only solution. You know, we read about Jesus in the Bible, and we see that there were many healings that he did. Many times he raised the dead into new life. I, I, I give you a couple of examples, and, and these are sneak previews. You ever go see a movie, and you watch the sneak preview before you go see the movie to see whether or not you want to go to it and watch it? and pay your hard-earned money to, to go buy a ticket for that movie? You know what I'm talking about. What's the sneak preview? 
Well, we can see the sneak previews and we can look at Jesus in his life and we can say, do I want something better than this life in America and this country and this world? Do I want something better than this life? Do I want something better? Do I want heaven? Do I want God? Do I want his son Jesus? Look at the sneak previews and look at all the sickness and the heartache and the pain and the suffering, the death and all that we're having to deal with. Look at it. Just look at it. And then let's look into God's inerrant and infallible divine holy word, folks. And let's look at John chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. There was a crippled man there. He could not walk, never had been able to walk. I think it was over 38 years. Jesus came into that crippled man. And he said unto him in John 5, 8 and 9, he said, Rise! Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole. And he took up his bed and walked. And then uh, go on over a few chapters to John chapter 11. And there you find that Jesus' friend Lazarus had died. And Jesus wept, it says in John eleven thirty five, 35, as he was there grieving with his friends Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. But Jesus approached that grave with people standing around. And listen to me, folks, in John 11, 43 and 44, Jesus said, Lazarus, 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 come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot in gray clothes, his face bound about with a napkin. And Jesus looked at him, and he looked at them, and he said, loose him and let him go. See, this life might be hard. It might be very treacherous and perilous and painful. But there's coming a day. Oh, there's coming a day. We have a better day. We have something to look forward to, church family. There's going to be a day when all sickness will subside. When all germs and all viruses and all deaths will be no more. It says that in Revelation 21.4. And God said, I will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Yes, what's going to happen one day is we're going to meet the end of the road in this particular life that we are in. And those of us who are Christians, we are going to hear him perhaps say, rise, take up your bed and walk, or Loose him, loose her, and let them go. Listen, whatever binds us in this earth, we will be loosed from it. We have a better day coming. Jesus, when it comes to, to, to the coronavirus or to sickness or to cancer or to heart disease or to liver disease or what have you, Jesus is the answer to life's problems. Then I will tell you the pollution of sin and the doom of hell. That's a problem. There's so much sin in America today. It's shameful. It's so much sin. It is so utterly shameful and embarrassing. You know, it's all because of the fall of man. In Deuteronomy 6, or Genesis 6, 5, rather, I'm sorry, Genesis 6, 5, God said, and this is right before, prior to the flood. He said, it says, God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every thought and the imagination of his heart was only evil continually. There's so much sin in this world. Sins of sexual immorality. The sins of drugs and alcohol. There's so much violence, so much hate, so much anger, so many bad things in life are going on. What is the answer to it? You know, Satan is the root of it, as I said earlier, at the onset of this message, Satan is the root of it. And we find in Job 1.7, well, one day God asked him, he said, what are you doing, devil? And what are you doing, Satan? And he said, I'm going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. Peter understood that. You know, the devil's always on Peter's back trying to get Peter to sin. 
And, and Peter wrote it down. He said in 1 Peter 5 8, be sober, that is be alert. Be vigilant, that is watch out. Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. He walketh about seeking whom he may devour. John, who was the very close friend of Jesus, he wrote when he saw the revelation on the island of Patmos of the end times, John said in Revelation 12, 12, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. Inhabitants of the earth, who are they? You and I, and everyone in between, and everyone on the outside of the circle of our life, everyone who's ever lived, is living now, or ever will walk on the face of the earth. We are the inhabitants of the earth. We live here. Why is there a woe pronounced unto those of us who live here in this life? The answer is given in that same verse, Revelation 12, 12. For the devil has come upon you with great wrath, that is anger, indignation. He is furious. The devil is on our backs. He's in our churches. He's in our homes. He's everywhere. He's in our schools. The devil is walking up and down the streets, just like Job 1-7, going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. The devil is working overtime. He's putting in extra hours. He's working with a sense of urgency. And why? Because Revelation 12, 12, I'm not finished with that verse. It still goes on even further. And it says, because he hath but a little time. You know what that means? He knows his day is drawing near. When Jesus will rapture the church out and those who are lost will be before the great white throne judgment and the devil will be cast into hell forever. So he knows his time is running out. For those of us who are Christians, you and I, the church, he's already lost us. Then why does he bother us? Because he's mad at us. And he wants to make life miserable for us. Out of vengeance, out of hate. That's what the devil does. He attacks the child of God because even though he's lost us and can never touch our soul, which belongs to God, he can still afflict us with cancer or dementia, Alzheimer's. He can cripple us. He can do all kinds of things. He can make life absolutely miserable for us. I guarantee he's doing a number, isn't he? And then those who are lost, those who are lost do not know Christ as Savior. He's doing everything within his limited power. And I do emphasize the word limited because God's power is unlimited. But his power is limited, and he's, but, he's doing, but he does have great power. And let us, not, let, let us not underestimate the abilities and the power of the devil. For you know what? The devil has studied man ever since the creation and fallen man. And the devil knows us like a book. I know we men don't know our wives, even if we've been married to them 30, 40, 50 years. But wives know us men like the book, right? That's what they say. <laughs> but I will tell you this, the devil knows all of us like a book. He knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows what will make us fall. He knows what will make us sin. He knows what, where we'll succumb to his temptations. He knows where to throw the fiery darts. And he's doing, he's doing all he can to take lost people into hell and make Christians' lives miserable. So what must we do? Jesus is the answer. He's the answer. You see, for those of us who are among us who may be lost, the only thing we can do is repent. Acts 3.19 says, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It's the only thing, the only hope. Repent and receive Christ as Savior. If we are saved and we're going through hardships and pain and trials and tribulations, He's the one who will comfort us and help us. And how He will do it is when we look 
listen, this is very, very important. Everyone do hear me now. If we want God to help us, we need to help ourselves. And we need to do right. And to do right means that we must acknowledge our own sins because we all sin every day. We must ask God to forgive us. And as that old verse says, it's my, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. I've quoted thousands of times, Psalm 5110, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We need to pray that. We need to ask God's forgiveness, and he will help us. Yes, life is treacherous and perilous and hard. So what can we do in America? Well, they say go to, in elections, go and vote. Well, let me say that every day is an election day. And what I mean by that is that every day God chooses us. He has chosen us. He chose us in eternity past and sent his son to die for us so that if we'd choose him, we would in turn be saved. God chose us, have we chosen him? Now he cho chooses to bless us and, and honor us in our lives and to do good things for us every day in our life, but we can be our own hindrance. So what we must do every day is we must choose God. Every day we wake up instead of, oh, my, that arthritis has hurt me today. Oh, I don't know if I can get out. Oh, that, that old sorry old alarm clock, and we hit it and knock it off the end table. Just can't get going today. Oh. Instead, we need to all say, God, thank you for giving me another day. Amen. Forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you a life that is true, striving to please you in all that I do. Amen. Every day we should choose him. Why? Because of all the problems that are in this country and in this world, Jesus is the answer. Let us pray. We come to